Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, it's been a little bit, I just started a new job. But anyways, in this video, we're going to be talking about Pale Fire by Vladimir Nabokov. So this is my first time reading Pale Fire. I had read Lolita once before, and I'm, I'm going to get into this more, but um, n the discourse on Nabokov and like academic circles is very interesting and polarizing and I think probably frustrating for everyone involved. Because it really seems like um, this is an author that people can have very, very different experiences reading the same book, which is always true, but it seems especially dramatic with Pale Fire and Lolita. So I think you can feel like you're a little crazy when people around you are saying something about a book and you're like, that is not even close to how I read it. So I don't know, it's it's interesting. Um, Pale Fire is very layered and I think there's a lot of different ways to look at the story. So hopefully that means interesting discussion in the comments. But anyways, I mean, I don't think there's any book where more people have told me and people who read it like me that we were wrong um, than Lolita. And frankly, I didn't want to make a video about Lolita because of that, so <laughs> Pale Fire instead, which I, I really, really loved. So this book is primarily about two men, uh, John Shade, a notable American poet who we learn early on um, dies shortly after finishing his last work. And we have his neighbor, Charles Kinboat, who is a professor at the same university, and also slowly reveals this crazy king in exile backstory that he has. And Kinboat is the voice that we hear most of the story through. He's our primary narrator, and so um, John Shade's murder and all these other things we're seeing through his perspective. So the book is considered a novel, generally. It does not take the structure you typically expect from a novel. So what we're given is this final work by John Shade, the actual poem itself, and 999 lines. And then we're given the rather lengthy uh, commentary to those poems written by Kinboat. So really, Pale Fire does feel ahead of its time in that kind of genre-bending way that it doesn't follow expectations or like neatly fit into the category of novel. And I think that kind of ahead of its time feel comes out of Nabokov's works a lot and why a lot of writers really like Nabokov. But really, the structure is perfect for these characters and it makes so much sense because, you know, John Shade, he kind of gets pushed to the side by Kinboat. And so, you know, as far as space in the book, his actual words in the poem don't take up a lot of space, but they're very impactful in a quiet, beautiful way. And then we have Kinboat with all of his commentaries and notes to the lines of the poems, and he's literally inserting himself into the story, into John Shade's life, because this is an autobiographical work, the poem Pale Fire. And like, Kinboat is insistent on finding himself in that somewhere. So the nice surprise for me about this work is that there's a lot of humor to be found in that. Kinboat can be a fairly absurd and ridiculous narrator. Like he will take any tiny thread, any single word that he can connect to his own story and use that as an excuse to go on for pages and pages talking about himself. And he often seems to kind of forget that he's writing about Shade and his works. And so he, he's always going on these tangents, which is pretty entertaining, pretty amusing, especially in like the first half of his commentary. And what he's giving us is this incredible story that we sort of slowly realize he's obviously talking about himself 
being an exiled king from this beautiful, amazing country, Zembla, and this crazy adventure that brought him to America living and hiding as a professor. But, you know, it's interesting because that story really has nothing to do with the poem that he's supposedly uh, commenting on. And the way he talks about um, Shade's wife, Sybil, is pretty funny early on too because it's very clear from the poem that John really loves his wife and Kimboat is like convinced that they do not have a good marriage and she's like the one ruining everything. <laughs> like for instance, uh, he's clearly, before he got to read the poem, he was under this delusion that Shade was actually writing about his story and he was writing about Zembla. And then he finds out that the work is actually about Shade's life and the traumas that he went through and he's like really disappointed by that. And it seems like Kinboat mostly attributes that to Sybil. He thinks she's like super controlling or something and edited all of Kinboat out of the manuscript. But like reading the poem, it's very, very clear that... B. <laughs> It's very clear that this is the poem that Shade needed to write, that he was perhaps addressing something more personal in his writing than he ever had, and this was like the work for him, perhaps his masterpiece. And like all Kinbo can see is, this was supposed to be about me. Why is it not about me? <laughs> like Shade is literally writing about losing his child and the trauma of losing his daughter Hazel and sort of grappling with is there life after death like is there any hope for her and like Kinboat's repeated intrusions into that it's funny at first at first it's funny let's say Because at the point in the commentary where um, Shade is directly writing about his daughter Hazel, who died by suicide, Kinboat has this complete disinterest in that whole story. He's like complaining about the space it takes up in the poem when Shade could have been writing about, you know, the exiled king. So that, that coldness, I, I kind of, in my reading, felt like that was the turning point where you start to think, Kinboat's like not a super reliable narrator. Maybe he's not the person who should be writing this commentary. And that's when the whole book kind of changes. You know, he's not just this self-absorbed but seemingly harmless person. He does seem to kind of be actively causing harm now. And there's really something sinister in the way that he's like latched himself onto this manuscript and onto the Shade family and their story as a whole. Because we sort of realize he's only known them a few months. So why is he the one writing about Shade after his death? You know, it becomes very clear that he doesn't really know him at all. And then we really begin to not trust him at some point, which, you know, an unreliable narrator is always interesting, but this um, idea that he's kind of uh, examining this biography of a man that he doesn't understand or know anything about is a really interesting concept. So like the poem is all this pain and trauma and brilliance and like actually, you know, as a poet, really beautiful poetry that I enjoyed reading in and of itself. And I think we get the impression that John Shade is a good man, a good man who's seen a lot of suffering, but a good man and a talented and brilliant one as well. And Kinboat is like this complete vulture in his life. So yeah, I think we really start to see the seeds of that and how dismissive Kimboat is in his commentary about Hazel Shade. And then you get that same kind of feeling like really hammered home at the very end of the book when Shade dies. So Shade is shot. Um, there's two versions of why he was shot. 
the version that we're given through the entire book from Kinboat is that this was someone from Zembla coming to assassinate him and Shade just kind of got in the way. And then sort of at the very end, we learn that the police actually have a different story that this man escaped from like an insane asylum and he thought Shade was the judge who put them there and that it was like a revenge killing and mistaken identity. But either way, Shade is shot, he dies, and Kinboat gives so little emotion or time to that fact. You know, he keeps asserting that he was this man's friend, his confidant, and he doesn't seem to care that he's dead at all. His first thought is about securing this manuscript. And he doesn't care at all about the grief that Sybil is going through. While she's still in the throes of that grief, he kind of tricks her into signing away the rights to this manuscript so that he can publish his commentary. So like him being so engrossed in this work and not caring about the Shade family themselves, it's like disturbingly obvious in that final scene. And what's so brilliant about the work is that that discomfort slowly builds in you as you go through the commentary. Like at first Kinboat can be kind of amusing and funny and charming in his weird little way. And then as it goes on and on and on, you're like, oh, wait, he shouldn't be doing this. You know, I don't want to talk about like Lolita too much because this is a video on Pale Fire, but the books do feel very complementary in that they both kind of have this complicated narrator that people uh, interpret in a lot of different ways. You know, at this point, this is where we get into the Nabokov discourse that seems to like split pretty sharply. And, and it is in that discomfort and trying to figure out why you feel that discomfort. Like why does Pale Fire feel kind of unsettling? And personally, I, I don't think that it's simply in just like over identifying with this narrator or like empathizing with him or like just being like, yeah, go him, he's right, or like agreeing with him in any way. Because that does seem to be a path that some readers of Pale Fire take, that they're like, they feel like the significance of it is that they're, they're sort of tricked into liking this guy or thinking, yeah, this book should be about Zembla, which I, I didn't really feel like as I was reading that I felt that way or that I was like with him, you know? Though I did find him like funny and interesting. I didn't agree with him. <laughs> but no, how, how I really see that discomfort and kind of like the, the essential tension in this book is that we as readers are seeing like the victims, the Shade family, um, we're really seeing their story. We really see and understand Shade's work, Pale Fire. But our narrator, Kimboat, he doesn't see it. He doesn't see Shade. He, he doesn't see Hazel. He doesn't understand what the poem's about, not really. And it's, I think, feeling that contrast that feels so unsettling that we can see um, what Shade is saying and the pain he's feeling about his daughter and, you know, him and his wife, how they've dealt with that. And Kimbo does not see it. He only sees his story, which, you know, is not unlike in Lolita. Um, it's not disturbing because we're tricked into thinking the narrator is justified or empathetic in some way. It's disturbing because we see Lolita crying every night and the narrator does not. Like Kimboat's obviously a very different kind of narrator, but he's also sort of self-deluded and sees things in this very narrow way and that causes him to do some pretty selfish things. 
and causes the person whose voice we're getting, the person who's telling us everything, to not get even close to what the actual heart of the story is. And so in the end, like the very, very end of this book, we get this hint that, you know, maybe this is where people feel like um, Nabokov's like kind of tricking you in a way, but we get this hint at the end that all of this stuff about Zembla and the assassin and the exiled king Charles Xavier, maybe none of that was ever real. Like, Zembla's not a real country. It doesn't exist. No one is corroborating uh, Kim Boat's side of the story and how John Shade died. And it seems like we, we have no other voices confirming all of this crazy stuff that Kim Boat has said. So, you know, he's built this whole fantastical world and he's brought us into it and it's this like sparkling, dramatic, crazy thing. And at the end, like the last page, it feels like all of that falls away. And then without all of that, what's left is the poem itself, Pale Fire. And so it's this really interesting thing where we have this story within a story and it's like the outside story is the ramblings of a crazy person. It's not even real and the actual story is about Hazel. Hazel and her death and how her father is trying to come to grips with that and how he uses his creative side, his writing, his poet, to grapple with that. So this really beautiful, tragic core is like such a contrast to this like colorful zembla that's built around it in the commentary. You know, the poetry itself is really dealing with death and, you know, John Shade is admittedly not a religious man so how can he find meaning in that or hope for the daughter that he lost way too soon? And of course, all of that feels even more poignant because all along we know that the end of the poem is like rushing toward his death because the day he finishes that poem is the day he dies. You know, this is Shade's story. The whole thing is Shade's arc leading to the day that he's gone. And Kimboat's kind of an intruder in that. But yeah, I mean, Pale Fire is so layered and interesting. And I think that's what I get from Nabokov in general now. Two books in, I'd like to read more in the future. But there's this brilliant, very complicated nature to the story there. And I think that's why uh, so many people can read it so differently. And I'm sure plenty of people read Pale Fire differently than I did. He leaves a lot of it open to interpretation. You know, like issues of morality are brought up a lot with Nabokov's works. And I really think that comes from the assumption that he wants us to identify with these narrators in some way. And I really, I don't feel like that's it because I read these books and I don't identify with them. So maybe that's just me. But you know, these are fictional characters. They are not Nabokov himself. And I don't think they're about strongly empathizing with people who do bad things. I think they really highlight um, the difference in how people interpret things and see things through their own lenses. You know, Kimbo sees all of this through his lens. And then we as readers all see it through our own lenses too. And that's why the discourse just gets so complicated. Yeah, I mean, a really fascinating book, had a lot of 
humor that kind of balanced out some of the darker things I've been talking about in this video. And it's just an interesting concept. Um, this person who doesn't really know anything about this guy writing like biographical information about him. That was like the main source of the humor as you got deeper into the book was just like he literally doesn't know this guy at all and he's writing this like super important final commentary after his death. He doesn't know him. <laughs> but he has completely convinced himself that he does. Which, you know, he's also convinced himself that he's an exiled king from a country that doesn't exist, so. But yeah, I think now I'm gonna go read what other people have said about Pale Fire. And I'd really like to read um, Speak Memory. I already have a copy of it, so maybe at some point in the near future I'll get to that one. But yeah, highly recommend. Like, what a great example of uh, experimental fiction and honestly excellent proof that Nabokov was a really brilliant writer. I mean, to have Shade and Kimboat uh, be such different voices in the same work. Very interesting. Okay, well, that's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching. Bye.